guys, this is V Diamond in the Rough, and I thought I'd do a whip and chat, but I thought I'd go back to doing my treble whip and chats. Um, I am working on my Anubis, which is a 40 by 95 square, and it was from Royal Diamond Painting. And I thought, well, this is appropriate where I would uh, share my Egypt travel. So Anubis, um, is he the, I think he was God of the Dead, uh, and basically oversaw the embalming of the pharaohs, or the um, um, embalming of the dead. Um, he is, hang on, I will get this information up. He has the black head of the jackal um, and as you was looking at it, why it's a, a, his head is black, um, one is because it symbolises um, good fortune and rebirth. Because the soil of the Nile is black, so they believe that that was, um, that, that yeah, gave birth to the world a type thing. Um, yeah. Okay, anyway, my trip to Egypt. Um, basically, was it nearly, nearly two years ago. So I went to Egypt on the 16th of November, uh, 2017, and today's date is the 2nd. So I'm going to be reliving some memories of not long gone. Um, yeah, I initially saw a tour for Egypt. So how this came about, I initially saw a tour for Egypt on the African Safari Co. Uh, and for those of you that have seen my African travel stories, um, it's the company that that did that holiday but I saw it on their holiday and um, on their website and thought that'd be something good to do uh, I was when I first started looking at a holiday was because at work we'd been told that our our department was going to be made redundant so we're going to get pay, pay, paid redundancy packages um, and no longer have jobs <laughs> So, and having to go through redundancy is a horrible thing, absolutely horrible thing to go through. Um, we, as a team of, I think it was about 75, we as a team of 75 were told we were going to be made redundant. Um, we had to train the, those that were going to do our job and also write procedures. Um, and now when you consider what redundancy is, um, companies do redundancies because positions no longer exist and all the roles still needed to be done, they changed them to their um, Kuala Lumpur location which was cheaper labour costs and because it was ch being changed to another location um, our positions were legally allowed to be called redundant. Um, now, how I know all of this side of things is because I was payroll, I was HR, so we actually had to understand, as part of our jobs in itself, we have to understand the process of that. Part of my job was doing redundancies and terminations or end of pays, end of work pays, um, so we understood the redundancy process, we understood how it's done, why it's done um, and what happens with employees, pays and all that. Because we, well what that was our job, <laughs> that, well, for some of us that was our job. Part of my job dealt with um, superannuation, um, leave, um, tax, all of that. So it was, um, it was, it was a good job. But, in being told we were made, being made redundant, 
we were told we were being made redundant, but we weren't given a date. We were not given a date, which is pretty hard. But we weren't given a date because they didn't know how long it would take us to train the other team and get it all up and running and all of that. So what happened with the length of time? You would find that as part of a redundancy, if you're getting made redundant, generally you're told you're being made redundant and you're getting told you know, your job's no longer valid in, in six weeks. That is the requirement is six weeks. Um, in most cases it is, it is six weeks. There is uh, some exceptions. But you should, you're not supposed to be told um, any less than six weeks from your uh, finisher. Oh boy, he's going off. Someone across the street is not happy about. Um, so for us, we knew that we would have to, at the beginning we didn't know everything that we'd have to do, but we just knew that they, our jobs were going overseas. Um, and in that process, because we didn't know our dates, it was pretty hard to comprehend. We were in a team where, um, how do you put it? There was already people in the team that were close to resigning for other reasons and decided that, oh, I'm being made redundant, oh, I won't take any longer than six months and you know I'll get my package because it is a generous pay package. So you had people that stayed that were leaving but didn't want it just yet, yeah, just stayed because they were going to get money instead of resigning because you get a totally different pay packet. So you had that, you had employees that were unhappy, you had all sorts of situations. But in saying that, um, losing your job is one of the high stresses in the world. Um, losing your job because you have, and having to train somebody to do your job is pretty degrading. Very, well, very degrading, not pretty degrading, it is very degrading. So in a team of 75, it's an interesting process because it's almost, I put it down, I would say to people that it's like the grieving process. You've got all your different stages of grieving when you lose a job. But when you go for as long as we did, our team, different people would be at different stages. You know, you'd be angry, you'd upset your acceptance. Um, just all the different stages you go through emotionally and when you're in a big team everybody's at their different stages and you'd find that someone would be angry about it and because they talk to somebody else that's already got acceptance they'd turn around and um, it would then set them back from acceptance to being angry or disappointed or you know stressed out about not having a job and all of that so everything had a knock-on effect because I suffer with um, an illness that you know I have I, I get depression pretty bad I had to tackle it in a different way to a lot of people because I knew that if I didn't tackle it the right way like yeah I was angry and all that at the beginning but I learned that if I don't tackle it the right way I was going to be in a whole lot of whole lot of bad place. So that with all of that in play, I decided well because I'd calculate redundancies, I knew what my redundancy would approximately be. So I decided that I needed something to look forward to. And so I planned this holiday. Um, when I started looking, you know, I'd seen the Egypt holiday and thought that would be a good thing to do. I turned around and said to Nathan, I said, you know, when I'm made redundant, I'm going to use some of the money to go on holidays. I'm going to take a holiday because I need something to look forward to at the end of it. Um, 
you know, I'm, it's not like I'm going to have a job <laughs> and I've got the money to do it and, you know, I knew how much I was getting and I knew how long I'd be without, how long I could be without a job before I really needed to work again. So <clears throat> in saying that, I turned around and said to him, I'm going to go to Egypt. And he turned around and said, not interested. <laughs> Been there, don't want to go back, not interested. Um, so yeah, I started looking at Egypt, holidays to Egypt. Um, at about, I think about 12 months before my redundancy date was actually given. But that gave me um, a lot to think about, a lot to plan, it was just, Every time something horrible at work, or it was hard to go through something that at work because of whatever, I kept thinking, well, I'm going to go on a holiday, I'm going to go and see something I haven't seen before, you know, so I had plenty of time to plan it. So the first thing I did was I looked at where I was going to, uh, the travel company I was going to go through. Um, knowing that I was going to be going solo because Nathan just went not going and I don't think he believed I was actually going to do it. <laughs> uh, I make my mind up to do something, it happens. It might take a while but it still happens. Um, so yeah, so I went searching and looking at uh, travel companies, who does tours. Most of the tours look pretty much the same. Um, I mean, to see Egypt, it's always the same places. There's not much in the way of changing. You've got your, the monuments to see, um, the Nile, all of that, you know. So when you look at the tour companies, so many were offering basically the same tour. So I started looking at the tour companies themselves and the information they were providing because I was travelling solo, one of the things that is big to me is um, obviously safety. And you go to a, basically a, well I mean that they aren't just a Muslim country, Arabic, um, Egyptian country, but um, as a Westerner, you know, it's something that you need to be very aware of, especially in the climate today just realized I've missed some symbols um, so in saying that I went looking at websites and I came across quite a few I came across Ask Aladdin this is a company I did end up going with now why did I go with Ask Aladdin because they their website had a lot of scary stuff on it <laughs> which was really funny because yeah, you think, oh God, they're, 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 they're giving all these things that you need to be cautious of, righty, righty, right. And which to me was, you're telling us the truth about going there. Um, you know, I'm going there solo. They're telling you if you're traveling solo, these are the things you need to watch out for. Um, women in the country this is what you need to look out for to protect yourself and all sorts of things like that and then i was also looking at reviews and one of the reviews was how the company is tr people believe the company the, the comments were that the company is trying to sell its tours because um it was really showing how unsafe it was and how they would protect you. Um, to me, my opinion was is that they were being realistic and telling you how Egypt is and they're not putting rose-coloured glasses on what's going to happen, what it's like over there. So I decided to go with them. From there, I just did a little bit of planning, just I kept it as something that you know, every now and then when I was having a hard time, I would go back and look at where I would like to go, what tour I'd like to choose, what changes to the tour I'd like to do, you know, additional, optional 
tours on the tour. Um, so, you know, whenever I was having a hard time, that's what I'd do. Because in the world of, in the planning world of a, a holiday, I, I get really engrossed and really in depth. So, um, from the time we were told we were going to be made redundant to actually given the date was 18 months. So 18 months is a long time to have it hanging over your head that you're going to lose your job. But 18 months also increased the amount of we were getting paid um, as our severance pay, our final pay. So everything got closer and closer to the, we got told the date, so I just got a little bit closer to planning it. Um, but I also did what I could to stay working within the company. Because it's a big company and because I'm flexible in my attitude and what I'm able to do, I have had many, many different jobs that I'm prepared to um, tackle just about anything thrown my way. I found a, I managed to get a secondment to a, another part of the company for six months, which was good, so which meant that I wasn't being made redundant, which is really cool. Um, but then after that, it was only a six month secondment and I'd have to find another role or I would get my redundancy package. But everybody has a belief that you're better off having a job. So yeah, I ended up getting a position, got a permanent position, which took the redundancy off the package, off the, off the plate for me. So I got a permanent position in train control, not as a train controller, which is what I am now, but as a, a time accountant, which was analyzing, sort of analyzing the time, the delays on why trains were, um, what was causing things to slow the train and the, um, from, yeah, just analysing times of train travel and stuff like that and what was causing them to slow down and be delayed. Um, and then I've, from there I ended up with a job with as a train controller, or well, rail controller now we're called. But before I got the job as a train controller, rail controller, um, you know, I still had this holiday I wanted to do, but I was now at a position where I had a job, so I had to basically put money aside to actually do the travel and get leave. Oh, this is a long-winded story on how I got my holiday, but you know, it's quite interesting to find how people decide to do holidays. So I will get there eventually. Um, so from that I had to say put money aside um, because I pay cash for my holidays I don't borrow money for it I've got to make sure I've got the money there to do it for me to you know to do it I don't want to go into debt because I want to have a holiday oh pardon me yawning away um, so I put the money aside um, was just looking at what dates when I could go and then the opportunity to apply for a train driver train controller job came up so I applied and I didn't get the job but there was well, we knew there was going to be another train con school train control school coming up the next train control school and I might have the opportunity for that so I turned around and said to my boss well Considering I didn't get it, I'm going to take my holidays, I'm going to go over to Egypt so that then when I do eventually get get it, get the job in train control, I've already been, you know, and I'm, I'm happy I've had a holiday. So I booked my holiday, paid for it, set the dates, <laughs> and then the day after I set the date and paid for my holiday, I found out I was going into train control school. I had actually got the position. <laughs> uh, but because it was all paid for, I couldn't, uh, what's the best way to put it? I couldn't cancel. 
because it was paid for, I had the dates, all that, and I, flights were booked the whole lot. And so train control school started and then my holidays was two weeks into train control school, which then delayed everybody else being trained. But it was a commitment and yeah, I got away with it. Um, because it was holiday approved, they were really understanding, which is really good. All right, so that's why and how I got to go. Um, I was also, towards that, at that point of time, I was also building a house. Um, I'd moved, I'd moved into the house, I'd finished building my house and moved in, you know, so it was all perfectly timed. The day, the evening I flew out was the day my front garden was landscaped. Uh, I mean, Nathan was home, he was dealing with all that, but yeah. Um, so yeah, that is the story on getting on and doing the holiday. In part of the holiday planning though, the tour was 14 days. I ended up going 16 days. I had, I was going to go by sleeper train from Egypt to Aswan and then catch, yeah, Egypt to Aswan by sleeper train, Cairo to Aswan by sleeper train and then up the Nile to Luxor. But there was a couple of places, a couple of additional things that I wanted to do. And one of those was to go to Abu Simbel. So therefore I didn't do the sleeper train, but you know, I was going backwards and forwards with the planning of the, with the tour company. And they were really helpful, really helpful. Um, when I got my quote for the holiday, you know, it was, they, they do an option of five star and five star deluxe um, me being me I went five star deluxe um, had to pay single supplement because um, obviously traveling solo uh, which was an extra 600 US to travel solo it's one of the things that yeah if you're going to travel solo that's one of the things you have to be prepared to pay um, all the time that doing all this planning, Nathan had been given the opportunity to join me and not interested. I think when I actually booked the, booked the trip, he was actually, so you are going, he almost, as if to say he didn't believe me, <laughs> but yeah, it's something I wanted to do, so I'm going to do it. So wait, I've got more holidays in my head that I wanted to go and do, so Nathan's been given the option, he's turned around and said they're too long, so he's not going to do it, so more holidays coming up that I've got to plan and work towards. All right, so from all of that, um, changes done, you know, changes to my travel itinerary, all done and booked and paid for, and um, I ended up I think that uh, if you actually go and have a look at my website so I will put the link to um, the trip planning and you'll see some of what I put there um, of what my initial plans were and how I got to the point of going uh, while I was Hang on, just looking for some more G's, I can't see any. Oh. So yeah, I will put the link down below, which has, which will be the link to the planning, which basically is the story you'll get there. Maybe a little bit of extra. Um, I did plan some extra. I had a couple of days in Hagada. Um, which was free time so I did go through your guide get your guide or something to do some extra tours outside of which is on my downtime um, so yeah that is how we got to the point of departure um, now I <laughs> 
I have a I won't say it's an irrational fear I have a fear of being late so for me to be at the airport on time um, my I don't think there's that many of those um, my fear of being late is you know I will get to international flights they say to be at the airport two hours before I'm usually at the airport about four hours before <laughs> <laughs> I am there when the check-in opens <laughs> and sometimes a bit before um, but yeah so I we got to the airport early Nathan drove me um, I think he was still surprised that I was going um, you know one of the things is is safety and I've turned around and I've said to him I've done everything I can in the way of safety I'm not traveling a lot, you know, I'm not, um, you know, I am traveling with um, a tour company. Now, this tour company, I will say, and I think others do offer it as well, but some, some of the bigger ones don't, they were a small tour company. They give the option of um, small group tours and the small group tour included singles. So my tour when I booked it was for me and only me. It was there was nobody else coming with me. I had my own personal um, guide and driver wherever I went. Um, you know, a driver that took me to all the the sightseeing things that were booked in and all that. It's not that I had the driver the whole time or the same driver. <coughs> but I had someone that would, a vehicle that was going to be used for my travels the whole time or wherever I was. Um, so, you know, I was, I was pretty safe and pretty confident about the trip. I will say I upped my life insurance because <laughs> I was going to Egypt. <laughs> I didn't tell Nathan that. <laughs> I didn't think he needed to know that. But part of my research was also looking at where the places to avoid um, we have TripAdvisor in Australia which tells you different things you know you know what's that um, what's that they call rethink your requirement to travel and then there's also don't go but going to Egypt is a rethink uh, are you sure you really want to go to this location because, you know, the height and stuff that's going on. Um, but there were some sections of Egypt that I wanted to go to and because there was a high alert on them, a higher alert on them, it was like, not going there. Yeah. But yeah. Pardon me, am I yawning? Okay, so I got to the airport and sat down and had something to eat with Nathan and then said for farewells I think he still believed I was doing farewells <laughs> and went into cleared all the customs side of things and all of that and into the airport lounges now I didn't realize that Emirates had its own lounge I because I fly Qantas Emirates and I had club membership I, I go into the club lounges so there's no um, I don't sit out on the metal seats waiting to go in I sit in couches in comfort um, one of the things about traveling like that it's it's safer as a solo person um, but yeah I get discount to club la flight, pla um, flight lounges because of where I work but yeah um, so yeah, I went into the Qantas Club Lounge, not the Emirates Lounge, Qantas Club Lounge and on the domestic side of things you go up to a bar and they pour you, a, you know, you ask for a drink and they pour it for you. In the international one, there's nobody there to serve you. You are able to serve yourself. Me, I like my scotch. I'm not a big drinker. When I'm on holidays I tend to relax a bit and have a bit to drink. When I fly, I drink, 
not copious amounts, but I'll have a couple of drinks, so you know, it does affect me. <laughs> but you, know, you go up to get a drink and it's pour it yourself. There's no limitation on how strong or weak you make the drink. Um, so yeah, I went in and had a couple of drinks, I updated my web page, I did the um, updated the fly out day. So I will put that link as well. The fly out day, you can see pictures, top of the page is Perth. Um, and then there's actually pictures of when I was in the airport in Perth and then um, I took you take a so I heard yeah I was there I was there having my scotches and I've looked at the clock and gone I haven't heard any flight announcements I better go and check it out if I'd gone down to the Emirates lounge I would have actually been given updates Basically, I was the second last person on the plane and they were they were almost at the point of coming and looking for me. <laughs> yep, nearly missed that flight. Um, but yeah, got on the plane. It wasn't too bad of a flight. Um, have to go. So from Perth to Egypt, you've got to go, depends on who you fly with, but you fly through Emirates, you go via Dubai. Dubai is an 11 hour flight, um, I think it was 10 o'clock at night, I think, hang on, hang on, just looking at it, 10.20 departure, um, so yeah, you know, it was late depart late night departure, um, so basically, they, they do those for a couple of reasons. One is, one of those is, um, you know, you, you sleep on the flight there. Um, I, because of my fear of being late, I, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just trying to work out how to put it, I take Valium. So Scotch and Valium go real well. I don't take them at the same time, but you know, I had Valium in my system and then I started on the Scotch. So, you know, I got on the plane and had a pretty chilled flight. Um, wasn't too bad of a flight. Got to Dubai um, and straight to the airport lounge. Um, I've done the Dubai stopover, you know, just for a few hours well more than a few hours and had to sit on those couches a uh, you know the depart uh, not in the departure lounge but I've sat on the in the departures at the airport and it's horrible once you get used to kind of you know work going to club lounges you, you never want to go back and do those metal seats again um, I've done them with Nathan but yeah so I've gone into the Emirates Lounge, which is you know, all the all the food and alcohol you can drink. They have showers. Um, I'll put a picture here of the seat that I went to, where you put your feet up, and show you what it's like inside the lounge. But basically, you put your feet up. Pardon me. They have um, sleep mat. They have little bed things where they have a blanket with a sleep mask and I think socks and you can actually have a bit of a snooze there so I did go in and I sat back and lay back and relaxed um, after 11 hour flight it was just nice nice to be able to do it um, I mean it was <laughs> it was basically breakfast time at home but I've gotten to the airport and gotten to Dubai and it's not breakfast time so uh, I think you will see on that table there is something, there is a drink there, I think that was actually another scotch. It's a good flight, it's a good trip. Um, so yeah, I kicked back in the lounge and then got on the, uh, got told that we were departing you know, to board the flight to Egypt, the flight to Cairo, and you go to a certain gate and then you end up on a bus 
and the bus goes around and takes you to the flight the plane that's taking you to Cairo and it's like oh my god you know it, it was almost like flying domestic some some parts of the um, Australian flight path you actually have to walk on the tarmac to get to your flight and I thought well with Dubai you wouldn't be doing that but yeah you do um, but yeah that was where I got on the next flight um, totally different environment to although it was still an Emirates plane it's a totally different environment um, to flying from um, Perth to, to Dubai it's, it's really stunning how much some flights change But yeah, um, uh oh, uh oh, have I just been doing, yep, holy cow, right here, I've just been putting drills on the wrong colour, crap all along, I got carried away, okay. So what I have to do is go and dig these out. Whoops. Uh, I changed the colour. I need to go and look at what colours I've just put and where. Um, now watch me pick these colours off. <laughs> um, so yeah, the flight was totally different to other flights that I've had in, uh, with Emirates. Um, it's interesting how it just changes like that. Um, for those that are seeing me pick these off, yes I have put them on the wrong colour. What I have done is um, change the backlight so it's less and I've got the top light so I can identify. So I've got those right, it's just the side ones just these over here that I didn't get right um, <clears throat> yeah and that one that one bear with me while I pick these up yeah okay I use those ones first I've got sticky on them <clears throat> so yeah um, yeah, gotten on the flight on that flight, um, and then coming into Cairo was pretty cool. I yeah, I come from a country where you have your dry, arid areas, and then you have your, your lush areas, or not lush areas, but you have your <clears throat> your where you've got the farming communities and all of that. So when you flying over desert you know it's desert but it's not desert like my gosh Cairo desert Egypt de desert bring that light up now um, <clears throat> so yeah coming into Cairo was rather interesting and watching the the landscape change and it basically didn't change is more the point um, the landscape was just um, just so desolate and then you get actually in to Cairo and you can just see this line of where obviously where the Nile was and all the vegetation and the lushness of that of what the Nile brings the life the Nile brings to the um, to the area uh, and then Coming into Cairo, you could see where the pyramids were, um, and I do have some pictures. What I will be doing is I will show you pictures um, throughout this, so you can see some of what it was like to come in. You can see how um, desolate places were, and then just where the green of the, the where the Nile was. 
it's pretty cool to see. Really did. Um, it's always good seeing a going and seeing a different different country just and when you fly in you just see them in a different perspective to what you would normally see obviously uh, in comparison to your own home country um so yeah got into cairo um didn't have to walk on the tarmac but, you know we did get into a normal <laughs> off ramp type thing and I'm there getting off and walking along and it's like okay now let's see where we go <laughs> uh, just followed everybody else um, yeah so I followed everybody else to out to the gates where uh, there are people out there with um, um, signs you know with your names on them so I've gone up and there's there's this little guy with my sign with a sign with my name on it. Oh there's a bee I missed. Sorry, I've got to find the bee. Where to put where was the bee? Three three three. Is it a stab and grab? I missed a bee. Um, so, yeah, he introduced himself, Mr. Ramadan, and he immediately took my suitcase from me, my carry-on luggage from me, and to said, follow me. So I just followed him, and then we got to a counter, and he goes, give me $25. And I'm like going, who the, what the, am I just handing over money? And then I kind of dawned on me, no, that's right, it was $25. Now, like part of the thing was you have to pay um, cash, US $25 to enter the country. Um, you were told about it, but it just kind of got me by surprise. Um, so I handed over the cash and he did the formalities. We went right through all the formalities of getting into Cairo. He dealt with it all. Basically, I stood behind him and he did all the talking. He did everything. I didn't have to worry about a thing. Hang on. Uh, next symbol. So, you know, with um, comparison of Australia to some countries, we don't see guns we our coppers our police um they do wear guns or some i think <laughs> but we don't see them um and i've gone into egypt and there's just these guards all over the place with these guns and i'm thinking you know jesus it's it's not what you don't expect because you do expect it but just to see 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 them so blatantly obvious obvious where it is in Australia they're not you don't see that you don't you see the guards but you don't see the weapons um, even in, in the in the um, place you don't see you're more likely to notice a taser on a copper in Perth as opposed to a gun um, but yeah so I'm seeing all these weapons and I'm thinking yeah <laughs> thinking did I really yep yeah, I'm here but in all going through all the customs and the to get in all the international clearance the vi the visitor passes and all of that um, I was very nervous on just just it's just anxiety levels and when I get my anxiety goes up I shake um, the best way to um, explain how I shake is pretty close to being a human vibrator so oh pardon me I've actually grabbed my hand luggage back off of him you know it's a four wheel little travel suitcase but I've grabbed that off him and I've held on to it because I needed it for support and hang on looking for another symbol 
Where's my S and my E's? There's the E's. So, um, I've got my luggage back, my hand luggage back off of him. And then he's turned around and he says, what, what, does your, what does your suitcase look like? And I went, exactly like this, but bigger. Okay. So one of the great things of traveling, I, I travel with matching luggage because if I lose one, I can say it looks like this. <laughs> um, yeah, logic. So we've gone to the carousel to get the luggage and yeah, he's watching for it, I'm watching for it. And I finally calmed down and shot shaking and you know, finally relaxed a bit. Um, so this guy, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Ramadan, so he introduced himself as Mr. Ramadan, not as a first name, Mr. Ramadan. So he was not a guide, company, he was a company representative, which I didn't realise that he was a company representative, not a guy, but that's irrelevant. Sorry guys, I'm just trying to, E's and F's got to be watching, looking for the E's and F's. Okay, that's an E, yep. Um, so yeah, grab the luck, he, he grabbed, <laughs> He grabbed my suitcase and <laughs> he's the same size as me but skinnier <laughs> and he had a bit of a struggle with getting it off the <laughs> carousel. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> um, so yeah, we turned around, he grabbed, eventually struggled with my bag and wheeled it. Now it was on four wheels so it was nice and easy. I think he appreciated that. And got to a certain point and he goes, um, the whole, you know, he asked me to stop so that he could go to the toilet. Um, you yeah. know, normally, I don't know if that's something you don't ask for, but he was, it was as if, you know, natural thing, just, you know, just wait so he could go to the bathroom. All I could think is, you should have gone before you came and waited for me, but, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> So yeah, he's come back um, and grabbed my big suitcase again and off we go to outside to see, we get outside the airport and there's massive metal barricade and then there's the street and there's another barricade. So basically people waiting for their loved ones to come back, can't even wait at the airport, they have to wait outside the airport across the road and there's even more guards around the place than inside the airport and all I could think is yay <laughs> okay um, we got in and hang on while I see that one I think is in that one says in there got to the bus so it wasn't a car, I was in a bus, so I had a 12-seater bus all to myself, okay. Met my driver and still, I just, I never, I don't know my driver's name. I think he said it, um, and I probably should have asked at another stage, but he was, yeah, um, I he drove me so many different places. He, he drove me while I was in Cairo and in Alexandria. And I still didn't get his name. Okay. Um, so part off there and then we go into the car, into the van, into the bus and off to where, we was, where I was staying. Now I was stayed at um, where was it? Mina House, um, which is pretty cool. Mina House was pr really cool. Just try and grab my images back up. So you went to a Mina House, which is, it was a fair drive there. Um, but there wasn't much traffic and I made a comment and it was like, oh, it's because it's Friday. 
so their weekends are Friday and Saturday so there's not much traffic at all and I will say not much at all um, went through all you know his 12 Mr. Ramadan was telling me all this stuff about the place um, turns around and says population of Cairo was 22 or 23 million uh, just in Cairo and I've turned around and said there's 24 million Australia the country Australia our population is 24 million yeah so you know <laughs> and just to think that amount of people in one city is just like huge and you you know um, there was a few other things he gave me some phrases which I could not remember uh, no I mean I, I pronounced them I repeated them back to him but I couldn't remember them um, until I suppose a couple of days later or a day later or something um, one of them being shukran I think I'm pronouncing it correctly which was basically thank you and if you shook your head it was the same as saying no thank you and that was an essential word to learn um, yeah it's a polite way of saying no I mean which is like I say no thank you <laughs> um, so you yeah, we've taken a, the drive to the where I was staying gotten to on the way there with um, Mr. Ramadan turned around and said um, we'll, we'll there is the ability to do the optional extra of the lights where you see the lights on the pyramid and on the sphinx um, what was it called um, what was it called oh, I sound a light show at the pyramid um, yeah, who's telling me we could organise for that for tomorrow night and I've turned around and said to him no I've paid for that to be tonight um, I know when I travel for me when I travel I know that when I'm when I get there I'm always too buzzed up to sleep <clears throat> and by doing something it gets me quicker into that time zone of where I'm at so I've turned around and said no I'm booked in to do it tonight and he was like, oh, no, no, you're not. And I've pulled out my itinerary and given it to him. And he's read the itinerary. And he went, okay, yep. Because it was there, I had, in, had it on me. One of the big things when you travel, always have your itinerary where you can reach it. Always. Um, don't put it in your suitcase. Keep it in your hands. It's got information on there that's very valuable if you ever get lost. Um but yeah so he's read it and gone okay so yep taking me to where I'm staying we get to outside the gates and get we stop and they have a sniffer dog go all the way around it and you know you, for us sniffer dogs generally it's a drug search but no these are sniffer dogs for explosives apparently um, every time a vehicle goes in there doesn't matter how often it goes in there it has to be checked for explosives Welcome to the world of um, living in a world where, yeah, that kind of thing happens. But, um, got in there and taken in and he's done all the formalities for me, got my room key, all of that, turned around and gave me all the information and take me out to... So you've got to put your bags through security, go in, but you don't need it through security to take it out, obviously. But we've gone and he's taken me outside uh, to someone to take my bags to my room. And it's on, um, you know, basically a golf cart. Or, uh, you know, a buggy, a you know, motorised buggy, yeah. And yeah, my luggage has been piled up and I've been left with this guy that's just taking me to my room. Um, uh, yeah, and then that, that in itself is like, okay, yep, no worries. 
Um, and then when we get to the room, my baggage has to go yet again through security. My handbag is the whole lot goes through a scan before you get into where your rooms were. Um, I was taken up to my room and I've opened up the door and been a tad disappointed. I'd actually booked a room with the pyramid view and didn't get it. Um, I I could have gone back and complained and tried to do something about it but I'm in a foreign country and at that point I was alone I didn't have um, Mr Ramadan to be there um, so I you know I settled in got myself unpacked because I was there for a couple of days I don't like having everything in my suitcase so I've unpacked my stuff um, and yeah Mr Ramadan was going to pick me up at a certain time um, and he said oh, go and have a bit of a sleep and I'll pick you up we meet you back at this time so I didn't sleep um, I went and had an early dinner did I have dinner I don't think I had dinner um, but I went into back up I got all good showered ready to go out again and then went to um, went in, into the front reception and went and sat at the bar and waited to be picked up well I wandered around first wandered around the grounds because it's quite a big grounds and then went and waited to be picked up in the bar one of the rules that when you travel to countries is not to drink the water and not if you're going to drink you don't have ice in your drinks and I just completely forgot about that um, whoops. <laughs> so I've ordered this drink that looks really cool as you know there I had the scotch had a scotch there so you know scotch and coke with ice you know, standard drink for me drinking away and then I'm like going oh shit this has got ice maybe I shouldn't drink it and then it was like oh no there's alcohol in it I'll be fine this has got to be filtered water in this hotel um, yeah, there, was, there was no wishy there I don't believe um, and there I've been picked up and taken to the sound lights um, oh that was something about my room you will see pictures I will give you pictures of my room um, you, you'll see all sorts of videos and footage um, of my room and that where I go from my, so my rooms are being five star deluxe they are big rooms with couches and that bar fridges I've gone into the bar fridge and discovered that there's no coke in my bar fridge there is Pepsi and I was like going no I'm a coke drinker I'm not a Pepsi drinker I can't drink Pepsi um, so that was one thing <laughs> that was one one of my struggles in in Egypt was Pepsi over coke um, but yeah so I've been picked up from the bar and um, picked up from the hotel and taken to the sound of lights thing uh, it was pretty cool really cool to watch um, it wasn't too cold I had a jacket with me but it wasn't too cold um, you know this that, that time of year the sun set early so yeah there was a chill but I got some nice pictures there which I will share with you um, and on the way back I've turned around and said to so I was picked up by the same driver same vehicle um, I took my camera with my tripod but on my way back I um, got back to the vehicle and I said to Mr Ramadan I said I need to stop somewhere I need to get coke I have to have coke and he said Pepsi and it's like no I have to have coke <laughs> so we've gone to this store and he's come in with me so I've gotten out and he's come in with me and I've brought this coke and come out and yeah I mean I didn't buy much 
I didn't buy much coke at all. I just didn't think about it. But I take tablets at night time and I can't take them with water. Um, I can take them with milk, I take them with coke, you know, anything else, but I just can't take them with water. Um, but yeah, coke is really, yeah, that, that's my drink. That's my go-to drink. So, um, gone back to the hotel, gone through security, and um, got now, gone back to my room, and gone, shit, I, because I'd used my tripod, because um, night photography, if you, to be able to do some decent night photography, you need a tripod, um, so that you're not jostling the camera. So that you don't get blurred lights. Because um, I, 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 I'm not very stable with my hands. I get a bit of a tremor there and I'm, I'm screwed for taking photographs. So I took my tripod. But I've gone back to my room and realised that I've left my tripod behind in the bus. So sent an email to the tour company to say I left my tour, my, I've left my tripod in the bus and also said that I wanted a, a pyramid view room and I didn't have it um, so yeah um, you know I sent those emails off and then I went to dinner mmm nom 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 dinner fussy on my foods fussy on my foods but you know I've looked through everything and um, found Jenga curry, which is a seafood curry, well, a prawn curry. Well, well for, for Americans, it's a shrimp curry. Really nice. And this drink, and a drink, um, which was came out, looked really cool. Um, yeah, so that was, I had my yummy dinner. It was really nice. Um, served very differently. They come out with... Um, all the aspects of your meal on a tray in separate bowls and they put the rice into the bowl in front of you then they put the curry in, onto your bowl in front of you then they put your bread they put this that so it's all dished up on your plate in front of you not dished up on the plate and then brought to you which is quite an interesting interesting thing to see um oh yeah so yeah um yeah have my dinner I wandered around the the um, grounds a little bit and went back to my room. Um, went to bed. What I do? I missed that one bit. When I got to the hotel, got to the Medina, got to the house, Mina house, and then to my room the first time. Um, by way of keeping in contact with Nathan was via messenger video calling because he didn't have FaceTime and it's just cheaper on the internet um, you know you use the use the um, hotel the, the accommodations internet to do that so when I'd actually gone into my room um, I've done the video call with Nathan and Nathan was actually at, fr at a friend's place so um, it was pretty surreal to actually call up and speak to him and then um, have um, people on the other side going, wow, you're calling us from Egypt, you know. Um, so I've just kind of wandered around my room and showed them what my room was like and my view and all of that, uh, which wasn't that spectacular in comparison to if I'd had a pyramid view room. Um, but yeah, so that was basically the story of um, the trip to Egypt, all the planning and the booking behind it, and up to my first night and climbing into the bed and having a good sleep. Um, I don't, if I fly west, uh, sorry, if I play, fly east to west in direction, I don't get jet lag or I don't get jet lag that is noticeable but if I fly west to east I cop jet lag big time so 
I didn't cop any jet lag and you know, just gone to bed and had a really good sleep without any issue. Um, wake up at the normal time, at my correct time for going and doing my tour. So I'm going to leave that there. I think that's enough at this stage. Um, with the pictures I will add in, it will probably be longer than an hour this video, but I've reached an hour just on the talking. <laughs> Um, so I will put up some pictures so you can see um, what I saw on my first day in Egypt and um, hopefully you're enjoying this keep tuned as I work on Anubis I will do the trip to Egypt and um, yeah Please leave me any comments, any questions. I'll try and answer questions on, on my travels. Um, give me a thumbs up, thumbs down. And subscribe. And if you're subscribed, hit the bell so you can get notifications so that then my next little bit of travel, you are, you will hear the story. And I just realised that I'm using something that you haven't seen yet. If you're on my Facebook group, you've seen this. This is actually a cover minder that I made to hang on. Um, my drill tray, I actually made the drill tray with resin. <laughs> That's an air bubble with a magnet in it. Magnet underneath and yeah, cover minder. <laughs> interesting cover miner that's very 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 handy and not even using it as a cover miner because I'm actually leaning on that if I'd cut it that way I'd be a big different matter um, so guys thank you for watching yet again saying farewell and then getting sidetracked um, <laughs> so guys yeah thumbs up thumbs down leave me a comment um, let me know what you think of my travel so far and um, Stay tuned for another episode of my Egyptian travels. Um, I've got 95 centimetres of this to do. I think I'll get my travels all the way done with, but before I get this completed. So guys, thank you for watching. And um, bye for now.